Thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Um, my name is Kevin Hargaden. I am a social theologian, uh, which is a wonderful job title, which sadly doesn't mean that I have a budget for taking people for pints. Uh, it means I do theology at the intersection with uh, society and with policy, and I direct, I'm very happy to direct the Jesuit Centre for Faith and Justice. Um, so we are, are delighted that you've come out uh, tonight for this event. Uh, the event is, is being recorded and will be uh, uploaded to YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, and we want to thank the parish for giving us this beautiful space tonight. And uh, on your chair, hopefully, there's a light reading. I heard it described uh, page turning uh, JCFJ material in your bag that you can take home. Um, so, a, a little word of introduction. Uh, the JCFJ are like our reason to exist is to promote justice for all through social analysis, action, advocacy, and the thing that's really our unique selling point is theological reflection. With that in mind, last year, at the end of the pandemic, when we were able to you know, finally actually do things in public again, we launched this annual lecture in public theology. We hoped that this would be an event that we would have every year where we would bring the best theological minds to the most important questions that our society faces. Over the 40 plus years of the center, since it was first established by Peter McVeary and Frank Salmon and John Sweeney, a concern for housing and particularly for people who are homeless has been at the center of our work. Way back in 2009, um, we laid out a new vision for Irish housing after the economic crash, which envisioned housing as a human right, uh, which uh, constructed or reorganized housing so that it was geared primarily towards the people with the greatest need as opposed to the people with the greatest uh, funds. And we called for a housing market that was geared towards building up the common good, as opposed to enriching property developers. It's fair, it's fair to say that that research went largely unheeded. Um, <laughs> so we fast forward to 2017, we got together as a center and over the course of a year, we put together a piece of research where we argued that what was then the present system was founded on a flawed philosophy, which imagined that housing was a commodity that could be traded on the market. And we said that if the, these policies that have been adopted after the recession were to continue, there would be a tsunami of homelessness and a massive systemic crisis. There were politicians who tried to brand us as pessimistic, as naysayers, as, as prophets of doom. I, I wish that that was true. Uh, because it turns out we were optimistic. Uh, there were five and a half thousand people who were homeless the day we published that report. And it's well over twice that in terms of official figures. And probably I don't need to tell you about all of the other uh, precarity and difficulty that people are facing that uh, really is profoundly life limiting. So clearly there are a few issues of more pressing concern in our society than the housing crisis and therefore it's our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Suzanne Mulligan tonight to theolo theologically explore the shape of the crisis. The title is Theologically Understood. I think even Suzanne is going to struggle in 40 minutes to like fully explain it so that it's understood at the end of it. Um, but uh, it's going to be a great exploration of a really important topic. Uh, every single week, there's more reports produced about the policy and about the technical detail of this crisis. And JCFJ contributes to that massive ream of data. But we very rarely actually take a step back and consider the very big picture. You know, the, the really profound ethical and moral questions that are at play in someone living without a home. So that's one of the things that we hope to do tonight. Um, Suzanne is... Uh, native of Longford, and like everybody in the JCFJ, she is an avid cyclist. Uh, she's been a lecturer in moral theology at St. Patrick's Pontifical College in Maynooth for the last 11 years. Before that, she spent seven years at Milltown. Um, her research has spanned the AIDS crisis and intersectional questions about bioethics, just war theory and the occupied territories, the legacy of the Second Vatican Council, among many other things. But for the last few years, she's been thinking about the housing predicament. What we're going to hear tonight is in part a product of research that she's preparing for a book that she's going to publish with the liturgical press 
I won't tell you when, because that would put too much pressure on Suzanne in terms of deadlines. I fell in love with moral theology in part in lectures that Suzanne hosted in Maynooth College. So I owe a great deal of uh, a debt to Suzanne. I mean, my dad would say, Suzanne owes me reparations because I left a lucrative career as a computer programmer to <laughs> become a theologian. Um, but uh, throughout all my time of knowing and reading Suzanne's work, there's always a deep attention to detail and a real intellectual humility which I think is a virtue that is all too rarely present in, in academic life. Uh, Le Corbusier, the great French architect of the 20th century, said that a home was a machine for living. So does that mean that we are building a society that has no engine? These questions are hugely important, and it's my great delight to welcome Dr. Suzanne Mulligan, and I hope you can give her the warmest of welcomes. Well, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, Kevin, thank you very much um, for the invitation to be here with you all this evening and for your very warm words of, of introduction. Um, I am a little nervous about uh, this conversation this evening because, as I've been saying to Kevin earlier, I'm not speaking to you as any kind of expert, really, on this question of homelessness, not in the sense of being a policymaker or being an economist or a lawmaker involved in jurisprudence. I'm not a politician. Um, so I'm speaking, at, uh, I'm speaking about some of the, the theological underpinnings, as I'll, I'll, I'll say in a moment, um, that guide and shape how we, as Christians, for those of us who are Christian, uh, think about the, the deeper dynamics of what's happening here in Irish society. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm, Sorry if I don't have any practical answers <laughs> or any greater detail um, in terms of what is a very complicated and complex housing crisis in Ireland uh, today. But just by way of introduction, um, I'll just say a little uh, short piece of, of a personal reflection, if you like, just to get us, get us thinking. Um, this time last year, I was uh, lucky enough to be on research leave uh, at Boston College in the United States. I had a wonderful four months there, uh, enjoying tremendous hospitality and wisdom uh, from my colleagues in the theology department. During my time in the US, I was also invited to the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. And if I thought Boston uh, was impressive, uh, arriving at Notre Dame was sort of felt like another level altogether. I had a terrific week there and again, I was blown over by the hospitality and the generosity that I encountered among my colleagues. But in truth, I was a little uncomfortable and became more uncomfortable as the week progressed. The opulence of Notre Dame was really quite staggering. One of the people that I met while at Notre Dame was Professor Margie File, and some of you may already know some of her work. She divides her time between the Center for Social Concerns within the university and the theology department. In addition, she runs a homeless shelter in South Bend. And on the Wednesday evening, she took me to see the, the work that they do at the shelter. Located in an upper room of the building was a tiny chapel. And that evening, along with about 20 homeless folks, we celebrated the Eucharist. The chapel was very simple. We sat on fold-down chairs. There was no stained glass windows or magnificently ornate ceilings. The priest had to get ready in the downstairs kitchen. We had no choir, no musical instruments. But that was the first time all week that I felt at peace. And the contrasting environments in which I found myself were not lost on me either. The wealth and grandeur of Notre Dame almost towering over the homeless shelter in which we prayed together. And so it is with our own country and indeed the world over. Vast amounts of wealth, often controlled by relatively few, existing alongside ever-growing inequality and hardship. 
To put this in context, the UN Refugee Agency tells us that at least 82.4 million people around the world have been forced to flee their homes. Among them are nearly 26.4 million refugees, around half of whom are under the age of 18. Moreover, the UN estimates that almost 150 million people around the world are without a home today. But a further 1.6 billion people, more than 20% of the world's population, are lacking adequate housing. In Ireland, the latest figures that, that we have tell us that 11,742 people are without a home, and among them, 3,373 children. A further 4,830 of these people are under the age of 24 years. Incidentally, these figures do not include people who are in hospital, people who are couch surfing, as we call it now, or people living in direct provision centers or domestic violence shelters. So I was asked this evening to speak to you about some of the theological foundations that inspire and animate the work of this center and of those of you who are involved in homeless ministries of whatever kind. And as I said, I speak not as an expert on economics or constitutional law or as a town planner or whatever it may be. And I noticed just earlier that there's a very fine article in, in the notes which are on your seats um, which does cover some of these more technical issues, um, covering the, the legal and the economic trends over the last hundred years or so of this uh, country, leading to where we're at today. And it's well worth a look. So what I hope to do is to identify some of the key ideas that will guide and sustain our work uh, dealing with this qu question of homelessness. My starting point is the Catholic moral tradition. That's what I'm trained in. More particularly, Catholic social teaching. As many of you know, the, Catholic, the church's social doctrine is as broad as it is rich. So I will focus on the following three themes or ideas that are at the heart of it and that I think relate very um, directly to the housing crisis. The first is the idea of human dignity. Then I look at what we call integral human development. And then we'll consider how accompaniment of homeless people is an essential part of church ministry. So to begin, some general remarks on human dignity. What does this mean? Within the Christian tradition, the notion of human dignity is rooted in the belief that all human beings are made in God's image. Therefore, possessing an innate dignity that is not dependent on race, gender, sexual orientation, nationality, or economic status. Christian anthropology, with its deeply Trinitarian underpinnings, reminds us that human beings are profoundly relational. We are called to relationship ultimately with God, but also with each other. And we flourish when in right relationship. But we are unique. And so we should enjoy enough space within our relational lives to allow this distinctive nature, what is unique within us, to blossom. John Hume once said that difference is of the essence of humanity. No two human beings are the same. And so difference and uniqueness are to be celebrated and not feared. We know too that our affective relations are crucial. The experiences of love, of loss, grief, and vulnerability all belong to the human condition. And these experiences give content to the idea of human dignity, just as human, human rights discourse has for some time now. A significant moment in both the life of the church and the social doctrine itself occurs during the pontificate of John XXIII and later at the Second Vatican Council. 
For now we saw the full embrace of human rights in magisterial teaching. Pachamin Terras, Gaudi Metzpez, and Dignitatis Humanae were arguably three of the most significant documents of that era. And if we add Pope Paul VI's encyclical Populorum Progressio to the list, which deals with conditions that allow for integral human development, we find a corpus of teaching that outlines the Christian understanding of human dignity, corresponding rights, and the socioeconomic context in which humans might flourish. At Vatican II, the Council Fathers famously described the common good as the sum total of social conditions, which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. But importantly, they go on to say, and I quote, there is a growing awareness of the sublime dignity of the human person, who stands above all things and whose rights and duties are universal and inviolable. She ought therefore to have ready access to all that is necessary for living a genuinely human life. For example, food, clothing, housing, the right to freely choose her state of life and set up a family, the right to education and to work, to proper knowledge, and rightful freedom even in matters of religion. Gaudi Metzpez 26. This is a very positive statement. The Council Fathers are not describing the minimal necessities for human existence. They're concerned instead with human flourishing, with authentic living. They're concerned with imagining the circumstances in which people can live their best lives and realize excellence. They're concerned with the conditions that allows God's glory to shine through in our lives. And this tells us that the social, economic, and political structures exist to facilitate human excellence, to protect human dignity, and are at the service of the common good. Clearly, housing is crucial to such a vision, for without it, other rights and opportunities cannot be realized. The Council Fathers also named the ways in which human dignity is violated. And these include subhuman living conditions, arbitrary detention, deportation, slavery, prostitution, and so on. Again, housing named explicitly here in what the Council Fathers are saying. Later, Pope John Paul II in Solicitudo Re Socialis argued that commitment to the poor and the eradication of what he called structural sins are key to protecting human dignity. And in Caritas in Veritate, Pope Benedict names inequality as a threat to human dignity. More recently still, Pope Francis identifies the characteristics of what he calls a politics of indignity, which includes the, the commodification of the human person, a throwaway culture that now extends even to human beings, a culture of consumerism and consumption that places the value of people on their economic contribution to society alone. As an alternative to this way of thinking, Francis argues that we must develop a culture of encounter and foster proximity to the sufferer. What we find, therefore, in the social teaching of the church is a robust defense of human dignity, which includes analysis of the ways in which this dignity is, in, is violated or threatened in our world. And it is because of the precariousness of human dignity that Anna Rowlands, who spoke here last year, insists that dignity is entrusted. She explains that we are called to help others realize their dignity, including holding it in trust for those who are less able to defend their own dignity. We do this, she explains, through the practices of care. To illustrate the point, Roland speaks of the ways in which we care for those suffering from dementia, 
or the care that we give to our burial rituals, the care for the dead. In addition, human dignity can be understood, she says, as an active social principle. It's not some sort of static idea, some nice phrase that we throw around to defend our arguments or whatever it might be. Rather, it is a concept that pushes us out into the world to defend and indeed articulate its meaning and its demands. Rowlands says, and I quote, for dignity to be an active social principle requires individuals, groups, and institutions who are willing to embody and espouse dignity as a structural practice and value. It needs to become both the ritual habit of a particular community and part of its conscious memory. A final point to note is the way in which human dignity and vulnerability are connected. American theologian James Keenan, SJ, argues that vulnerability is part of our human nature. It is the condition for the possibility of our responding, of our being ethical. He says it precedes our decision. Without vulnerability, we cannot make properly ethical decisions. If vulnerability is regarded as weakness, however, as something to be avoided, then one thinks of invulnerability as one's goal. But Keenan explains, when we recognize that the word vulnerable does not mean being or having been wounded, but rather means being able to be wounded, then it means being exposed to the other. In this sense, vulnerability is the human condition that allows me to encounter, to receive, and to respond to others. It allows us to be aware of others and their <clears throat> dignity, and to take risks in meeting and in recognizing others. It is in this space of mutual recognition and the risk that comes with recognition and relationship where we begin to see how vulnerability is integral to our being human. It could be argued too that acknowledging our common vulnerability furthers or enhances recognition amidst difference in society and potentially might lead to a kind of a softening in inverted commas of social attitudes towards those who are more marginalized. Could an ethic of vulnerability improve our moral compass in a particular time and place? Brian Massingale, another US theologian, speaks again of this connection between vulnerability and solidarity. He sees vulnerability as a way of fostering greater solidarity within communities and within society. For Massingale, encounter with an experience of the vulnerable other is, a cru is a crucial in developing positive ways forward. It is a way of challenging what he describes as the culture of indifference to both racism, uh, arising out of racism and consumerism. Massingale writes extensively on this question of racism and structural sin in the United States. Might we say the same about the homeless crisis? and the stereotypes and prejudices that are often directed towards the unhoused. If we are to dismantle preconceived ideas about homelessness, then surely solidarity arising from a deeper awareness of our shared vulnerability and our shared precarity could act as a catalyst for change. Altering social attitudes, of course, takes time and the immediate business of attending to the suffering in our communities remains an urgent task. And so human dignity as entrusted and human dignity as a social principle, to use those two ideas, demands that we do more to tackle the injustice of homelessness. Strengthened by our awareness of our shared vulnerability and precarity, we are accompanied by, the, by our unhoused sisters and brothers as we do God's work in the world. A second concept 
widely used within Catholic social teaching, especially from the 1960s on, is the idea of integral human development. So this is our second theme. The notion of integral human development provides a framework that allows us to critique the conditions, the attitudes and the values that either support human dignity or detract from it. In Populorum Progressio, Pope Paul VI stated that today people are continually striving to exercise greater personal responsibility. And yet, he says, at the same time, a large number of them live amid conditions which frustrate these legitimate desires. He continues in paragraph 14 by saying, the development that we speak of here cannot be limited to economic growth alone. To be authentic, it must be well-rounded. It must, it must foster the development of each person and of the whole person person understood in her totality. If we take this as our starting point, then we see that integral human development must include the spiritual, cultural, relational, emotional dimensions of human existence. It suggests that the opportunity to contribute, sometimes now called contributive justice, is critically important also whether that be through economic, cultural, or social participation. The US bishops, in their 1986 pastoral letter, Economic Justice for All, understood this point well, saying, and I quote again, social justice implies that persons have an obligation to be active and productive participants in the life of society and that society has, an, has a duty to enable them to participate in this way. So it's a two-way system. We have an obligation to participate, but we also must have the opportunities to do that. They condemn unjust social structures that perpetuate inequality, deepen disadvantage, and inhibit certain groups from, from contributing society because of their race, ethnicity, or economic status. The idea of contributive justice is important for inter integral human development because it reminds us that we each have an obligation to contribute to society, but importantly, it tells us that we need the opportunity to do so. Contributive justice, therefore, requires the establishment of social structures that can facilitate and encourage people making positive social contributions without discrimination on the basis of gender, race, economics, and so on. And it suggests that social contribution is good in se. It is good in itself. It is a social good for people to enjoy what's called human agency and the freedom to participate in the life of their communities. In this way, Catholic social teaching emphasizes strongly the principle of participation both as a means to an end and an end in itself. Homelessness makes the realization of these goals impossible for many people. As the Irish bishops explain in a recent pastoral letter, housing is fundamental to our well-being, to our safety and to our happiness, and as such plays a pivotal part in human flourishing. The bishops argue that the right to adequate housing plays an essential part in the realization of several other rights, such as the right to privacy, freedom of movement, freedom from discrimination, the right to health care, education, and the right to a decent and safe environment. Being able to avail oneself of these opportunities being able to access facilities and services like education and healthcare is threatened by the insecurity and unpredictability of homelessness. It denies people the opportunity to become integrated into a community and contribute socially to the life of that community. A major threat today, both in Ireland and elsewhere, uh, to the provision of good housing 
access to adequate, good housing, is inequality. I'm using the word inequality this evening, I mean unjust inequality. We know that there are some inequalities, some discriminations that are in fact uh, necessary. I'm referring here to what we might describe as unjust inequality. Pope Francis warns against the dangers of inequality, most notably in Evangelii Gaudium and in Fratelli Tutti. He condemns what he calls economies of exclusion and explains that although some economic policies have enhanced economic growth generally, they have not promoted integral human development in a consistent or in an inclusive way. As a result, he says, new forms of poverty are emerging. So we're starting to rethink even what we mean by poverty today. And he tells us, again I quote, poverty must always be understood in the context of the actual opportunities available in each concrete historical period. Fratelli Tutti 21. That's really interesting. Poverty has to be understood against the actual opportunities that people can enjoy in any historical period. Widening inequality in Ireland is denying people the possibility of accessing a home and is driving more and more people to the brink of homelessness every day. Pope Francis is deeply concerned that we have become blinded to the inequalities around us and he's mindful of the ways in which sinful structures and cultural privilege deadens our moral sensibilities to the point where we don't even see the suffering around us anymore. In Evangelii Gaudium, he states, changing structures without generating new convictions, without generating new attitudes, will only ensure that those same structures will become, sooner or later, corrupt, oppressive, and ineffectual. And that's a really important point made in Evangelii Gaudium 189. He's calling for more than just structural reform. He's calling for a metanoia, a change of heart on our part. We need to see differently, think differently, develop new attitudes, develop new values. For the Holy Father, the most devastating effect of inequality is exclusion. Inclusion, on the other hand, implies full participation in society, access to opportunities, the freedom to contribute to the social experiment, as we just mentioned, and the ability to forge a sense of identity and belonging. Social inclusion takes us beyond mere subsistence and access to material goods. It is about becoming full and equal members of society, recognized and valued not for what we do, but for who we are. Inclusion means we can contribute to the task of creating a better social life together, and we can exercise moral agency over our lives. And yet we know that in Ireland, many people are forced to the fringes, we see all too vividly today how people are denied basic rights, such as the right to housing, because of flawed economic policies. And yet inequality is not inevitable. Unjust social inequality is the consequence of bad economics, perhaps, of skewed social priorities, of misplaced values. Inequality can be rectified if a society decides to do things differently. But it is an enormous challenge. And for Pope Francis, he says, a globalization of indifference has developed. Almost without being aware of it, we end up being incapable of feeling compassion at the outcry of the poor, weeping for other people's pain and feeling any need to help them. The culture of prosperity deadens us, he tells us. We are thrilled if the market offers us something new to purchase. In the meantime, all those living stunt, stunted lives, lacking opportunity, are a mere spectacle, and they fail to move us, he tells us. 
Francis turns to a virtue-based approach as a response to these difficulties, calling for greater solidarity, compassion, and mercy in how we face the challenge of living together in right relationship. The Irish bishops too have called for a new attitude in their pastoral letter. They insist we must move away from thinking of housing simply as a commodity, as an end in itself, and recognise instead that housing is a means to a greater human end. They say that safe, affordable and appropriate housing is a human right and it is not simply a commodity. And that thinking about the provision of housing cannot left, be left solely to the markets. They say the making of enormous profits through speculation in land, in housing developments and in maintaining high rents is particularly damaging to society. We must all work to change this toxic situation. The housing market must serve the people and society rather than further advance the financial interests of a minority. In a similar way, William T. Kavanagh rejects the notion that the free market, left to its own devices, will somehow miraculously rectify any imbalances in the housing sector. He says, there are those who are opposed in principle to any government provision of goods that the market should provide. But such voices do not uh, get much credence from those who advocate for the homeless, nor should they. The idea that the market will provide, if left alone, is one of the most pernicious forms of magical thinking that afflicts the contemporary world, and one that is refuted by the thousands sleeping rough on the streets. Thus, economic structures and policies, it is argued here, need to be reassessed and, and, and radically changed. As John Paul put it, the economy should serve the human person. The person is not there to serve the economy. So although structural approaches uh, to the housing crisis are urgently needed, as we all know, we must also be willing to shift our own mindset. We must think of housing in a new way and crucially must learn from those who are unhoused. We must work to change the perceptions and the stereotypes associated with homelessness so as not to think of the homeless person as a threat or as deserving of their lot in life but be willing to be transformed by their experiences through encounter and accompaniment. So our third theme, therefore, this evening, following on from integral human development, is the idea of spiritual accompaniment. So this is a very different dimension of what we call integral human development. We tend to think of development in those more material, economic, structural dimensions. Homeless ministries, however, play a crucial role in integral human development, a role that is sometimes gone unnoticed. And that is the ways in which homeless ministries work towards what we might call making spirits whole again. If integral human development is concerned, as we believe, with the person understood in her totality, with the spiritual, religious, emotional, and psychological dimensions of our lives, then this aspect of integral human development and of homeless ministry is crucial also. We know that the damaging effects of homelessness are many. Responding to the needs of our homeless sisters and brothers must include tending to the spiritual and emotional harm of broken relationships and disrupted promise. And so making spirits whole again is an essential part of the Christian mandate to love neighbour. As Pope Benedict reminded us in Caritatis in Veritate, integral human development requires a transcendent vision of the person. It needs God, he says. For without God, development is either denied or entrusted exclusively to human beings. And as we know, 
We, we tend to fall into the trap, he says, of thinking that we can bring about our own salvation and we end up promoting a dehumanizing form of development. So the transcendent nature of the person and our relationship with God, our journeying towards God, suggests that integral human development has as its goal attending to the wholeness of the person. It must include working towards social justice and peaceful environments in which individuals and communities can thrive. But homelessness also violates the dignity of the person. It erodes feelings of self-worth and value. It can have a profoundly negative spiritual and psychological effect on people. And it is for this reason that another American theologian, M.T. Davila, writes extensively about the spirituality of accompaniment in relation to homeless ministries. She's worked in the greater Boston area uh, in relation to homeless uh, ministries. And she says the following, the sole work of homeless ministries, attending to the spiritual needs of the unhoused and the housing insecure, must be part of integral human development. Efforts to address the material needs of the unhoused, of providing adequate shelter, the sense of permanency and routine that are key to feeling safe and thriving as persons and communities, must go hand in hand with attending to the deep spiritual wounds, both personal and systemic, that accompany the precarious life of homeless and housing insecurity. Feelings of guilt and shame that accompany the lives um, of the unhoused have been well documented. But for Davila, homeless ministries play a crucial role in restoring that sense of dignity and worth to people. She speaks of the ways outdoor or street ministries help bring healing, forgiveness and reconciliation to the lives of homeless persons. Homeless street programs rooted in an ethos of accompaniment confirm God's unconditional love with broken and wounded souls. She says, the sole work of homeless ministries is a key element to bringing wholeness where a combination of life circumstances, choices, and systemic forces have wrought economic and social uncertainty and spiritual harm, resulting in shame and a lack of self-worth. Davila argues that integral human development demands also that we identify the kind of labels that we give to homeless people and the dislocated. That we have to challenge the stereotypes around hu homeless persons being threats, as being disposable, or as being a drain on society. So there's a twofold challenge here for Davila, and it's one that's echoed certainly in the, wor in the work of Pope Francis. The first is to tackle the structural injustices that fuel and perpetuate homelessness. And the second is to tend to the deep human wounds inflicted by this crisis. Removing or reducing the precariousness that imposes insecurity, fear, and physical vulnerabilities on the unhoused must be an ongoing goal of those who work in homeless ministries. There's a danger here um, also of kind of separating these two dimensions of integral human development, the material and the spiritual. And if we do that, we run the risk on the one hand of perhaps over-spiritualizing homeless ministries. And on the other, we risk focusing on the provision of shelter, the provision of housing, to the neglect of the spiritual healing that is also needed here. Homeless ministries cannot do everything, but the notion of integral human development helps us at least be mindful of the importance of holistic strategies as we strive to accompany our neighbor. For Davila and for others, providing spiritual accompaniment and being with the unhoused is what she calls the, the, the sole work of homeless ministries and is an essential part of integral human development. 
It counters the deep-seated narratives of shame and replaces them with a renewed sense of the sacred worth of all members of our community. What Davila describes here is rooted in a commitment to accompaniment. Others have also identified the role of accompaniment, um, the role that it plays in, in homeless ministries. Drawing from Pope Francis's lovely expression or phrase, a revolution of tenderness, Mary Scullion and Christopher Williams, who work with homeless ministries in the United States, tell us that such a revolution is rooted in relationship and community, and that through the power of grace, we can foster mutual transformation. That's a key idea of accompaniment, mutual transformation. There isn't a hierarchy, it's mutuality that's at work here. Homelessness, as we know, unfortunately, has become part of the geographical and moral landscape of our time. And it can evoke fear and insecurity within us, particularly since it exposes the precariousness of human existence. But through accompaniment, we come to know the people who experience homelessness. And we come to see the distorted ways in which our society at times views people. As Scullion and Williams put it, poverty makes us confront, confront the stark truth that suffering is a universal and inescapable part of being human. And we cannot be fully human until we embrace the truth of that suffering. Accompaniment and the powerful human encounters that are at the heart of it can be both personally and socially transformative, therefore. And again, they say, by accompanying those who have suffered through homelessness, we discover the grace that empowers us to live more authentically with mercy and compassion. We experience the power of mutual transformation and we plant the seeds for a broader social transformation a revolution of tenderness, a political agenda that is grounded in the beloved community that fosters economic, political, and societal structures rooted in the dignity of each person. In doing so, they say, we accompany each other on the journey home. I have a few concluding remarks and I of this section, I call this section the disruption of the gospel. In Evangelii Gaudium, Francis calls us to be a church that goes forth. He talks about this field hospital, he talks about us going to the fringes and to the margins and so on. And this inevitably will be uncomfortable for many of us. We tend to welcome predictability. We enjoy our routines and we rarely appreciate being shaken out of our comfort zones. And yet this is the message of the gospel, the inconvenient and troubling call to discipleship. As Pope Francis explains, many try to escape from others and take refuge in the comfort of their privacy. Meanwhile, the gospel tells us constantly to run the risk of a face-to-face -face encounter with others with their physical presence, which challenges us, with their pain and their pleas, with their joy, which infects us in our close and continuous interaction. It is probably for this reason that people like Laura Stivers speaks of the need for an ethic of disruption. I really like that idea, an ethic of disruption which she says is critical to our tackling the homeless crisis. We need to disrupt the way we think and we need to disrupt the attitudes and the way we do things. She's thinking more in terms of the ways that we need to disrupt the structures uh, that perpetuate homelessness. But I would argue it also calls for an honest examination of the attitudes and practices within ourselves that somehow maintain the oppressive status quo. This ethic of disruption is what Francis is calling us to also. The creation of a more just, inclusive society will require 
a radical reshaping of how we do things. It will require us to be able to reimagine our lives and our relationships and embrace encounter rather than fear difference. Disruption is at the heart of the gospel. The countercultural example of Jesus offers us strength as we attempt to halt or to disrupt the policies and attitudes that perpetuate homelessness. But of course, let's not be naive. Disruption can be risky. The legitimate need for safety, however, should not become the excuse to force people to society's fringes. We know that too often the legitimate claims of safety become exaggerated and we build walls or we close borders and we turn away from our communal responsibilities. An ethic of disruption forces us to tell a more profound story, one of encounter, mercy and accompaniment. Thinking of housing merely as a commodity fails to capture the importance and the meaning of a home. Catholic social doctrine provides resources that can help us examine and respond to the injustices of homelessness in a more meaningful way. Church teaching in its rejection of unlimited capitalism reminds us that economic growth is not an end in itself, but ought to be at the service of the human person. Catholic social teaching does offer a vision, a framework, if you like, from which we can reevaluate our social values. It forces us to go beyond narratives of supply and demand and to stop tinkering around the edges of an ever worsening housing crisis. It demands that we begin always with the human person in all her frailty and fragility, recognizing the vulnerability that we each share and the reasonable hopes that we each wish to realize. It is a story that begins and ends in that upper room at Easter. Each of us equal, unique, somewhat afraid, and each of us in need also of God's redemptive love. Thank you. at least, Suzanne, we're not going to put you on the spot to like, give us lots of answers, but I'm going to uh, abuse my privilege here as being the MC and begin with a question of many, so I was assessing which one to ask, but I'm really interested with the idea of dignity, and it's very easy for us to think about how being rendered homeless is a violation of our dignity, but could you talk a little bit more about that? idea that you came to at the end about um, making the, 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 the soul whole with regards to how our dignity, I'm assuming my dignity, is diminished by living in a society where children are doing homework on bed in the hotel. Can you, can you talk a bit about the, like the shadow side, of, it's not really the shadow side, but the other side of the, the dignity argument. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Well, I'll try. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's one of these concepts, human dignity, um, like so many that we tend to throw around and we assume there's a common understanding or a common sense of, of, of what it is. Um, and it is a contested idea and there are different philosophies about this and people identify different things as the basis or the foundation of dignity and, and where dignity might be lost or forfeited even in some cases and so on. So um, it's, it is certainly a complicated idea. But in terms of the point that you're making, um, I think what, what we encounter within Christian theology and the Christian narrative, not just within Christian theology, is that interconnected sense of um, human life and of our relationality. Um, we are mutual and reciprocal beings. We can only flourish when community is flourishing, when we are each realizing our potential and so on. 
Now, it does sound a little bit utopian, and you know, it's not that we all get the same thing and we all live blissfully happy lives, but it, um, Christian anthropology does identify that very um, intimately kind of interconnected dimension of human existence. We are not individual beings living in isolation. So it does say something about us as a people or as a community or as a parish or as a family or whatever it is, where there is avoidable suffering happening and we are not doing enough to address it or we're not identifying it or we're not acknowledging it. We are failing ourselves as much as we are failing others. So it is that mutual interconnected dimension um, that pushes back responsibility on us. It's kind of a counterbalance to a more individualistic, you might say, approach to rights um, and an understanding of the person. Uh, the highly social um, um, picture, if you like, that you get within Christian theology pushes us back towards obligation, duty, responsibility. It's not just about my right to A, B, or C. It's my responsibility to others, and particularly to the vulnerable other. So where we avoid or neglect or ignore that, we are losing something of ourselves in the process. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And, you know, as, as Kevin said in the introduction, though, you know, there's any number of things we might want to talk about and try to highlight in, in, in this kind of a, a, an event this evening. The idea that the family is the basic sort of unit of society is really, really important within um, Catholic moral theology, within Catholic theology. The family is domestic church. This is where we um, believe it starts. So family is critically important to how we um, understand ourselves, if you like, uh, within the Christian framework. We're seeing more and more a kind of a new dimension of homelessness um, today. Uh, it's evident in other parts of the world for longer, but it's becoming, it has become a new feature in Ireland, certainly, where families and single and double income families are homeless because of enormously high rents and enormously high house, house prices. Um, key to ha having this kind of stability and security that we expect in, within families is having a stable home. So the teaching around marriage and the family and the family is domestic church is again another lens that we could actually start thinking about this and evaluating it. Uh, and evaluating the enormously harmful psychological impact that it's having on relationships, on children and their developmental um, um, outcomes and all the rest of it. Um, so it's that, that's a great point. It's a really important, I suppose, lens to, to think about this as well. And again, it comes back to what the bishops and lots of other people have been saying. Housing isn't just a commodity. It's something that's fundamental to our well-being. It's fundamental to stability within society and so on. Yeah. So contemplation and action, I think that there's just more sense around the first defense. Or, so the most major one that comes to me is the Apollo House protests. So I'm wondering, in terms of audiences and the work of the center, um, at a time when the churches and the churches of plural are the voice and authority in terms of, of, of speaking and so on, is uh, what should we say? Yeah. So where do you go? Know, 
born out of its current implication, its anger and all its own strategy. So can you say a little bit about that? Because I think that one of the most important things, particularly with such an about ethics and destruction. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm not going to incite anyone to revolution, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, what, what I would say about disruption is that, I mean, I said earlier, it's, it's at the heart of the gospel. We look to the person of Jesus Christ, and he was not somebody for the status quo. He pushed back against prevailing norms if they were unjust, if they excluded, if they marginalized, and he challenged his listeners and his disciples to a different way of thinking and a different way of seeing, one that was very unpopular, um, one that was disruptive to how society was organized, how people were seen, whether it was women, whether it was people with an illness or a disability. And that is disruptive to how we think, how we see. It shakes us up from kind of our slumber of indifference, that kind of idea, it makes us to makes us reevaluate, rethink. And it's only by doing that that we can then move forward towards action, saying, okay, well, if, if this is not good enough, if this is not how we should be thinking about things, what do we need to do differently? Um, if you think of the great, I suppose, sea changes throughout history, whether it was the abolition of slavery or women's emancipation or whatever it might be, it only, those kinds of things only happen because people were able to see differently. They imagined a different world. Um, they were able to break out of the prevailing norms and attitudes and ways of doing things and reimagine. And in that reimagining, they were probably, a lot of them, labeled as, you know, pretty crazy. It would be very difficult to try to convince slave owners in the southern parts of America in the 1700s, that the economy will do just fine without slaves as part of it, as the bedrock of it, and so on. Uh, not to mention the, the other dimensions of the argument. But it's by disrupting those prevailing patterns of thinking and seeing that we can reimagine, and that then leads to, to action. Action has kind of been at the heart of, of the Christian message throughout the centuries as well. We have articulated in it in a more formal way through things like liberation theology. The gospel pushes us into the world to change things. Um, so, so that disruption is, I think, has always been there. Um, and it doesn't make... Oh, sorry. We're, okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. It is the question. No, that's a fair point. Yeah. 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 And you know, I mean, I think I think what Pope Francis is saying is correct. There's a lot of indifference. Um, we get very comfortable and we don't like change and we certainly don't want that crowd moving in next to us or, you know, that sort of attitude. We all want to get rid of our rubbish, but nobody wants to live beside an incinerator. You know? We all want to do something for refugees, but we don't want them living right beside us, bringing down the value of our properties and all this kind of stuff. So it's those kinds of attitudes. Now, these are all generalizations. I'm not trying to be unfair to people, but... It is those kinds of underlying kind of attitudes that Francis is asking us to, to check within ourselves. That's why he's saying structural change is fine, but there needs to be personal change. So I think indifference might be part of it. I think in relation to some church-based organizations and, and particularly religious orders, one of the things I do, or used to do a little bit of work in is in, in relation to human trafficking. And there's a number of religious orders who are doing tremendous work in Ireland today on the question of trafficking. But the thing that they always ask me is, how do we as Catholic religious orders talk about something like human trafficking in the aftermath of abuse scandals and all the rest of it? The only thing I say to them is, you have to get out there and you have to do it. 
you know. There are, there are, sure, yeah. Um, just a two comments. One, I believe that Catholic social teaching will remain at a very high level of abstraction until there are structures within the Catholic Church which give a distinct voice to the lady. Yeah. One comment. Yeah. And that's, you know, that, that's it, okay. Um, the second one is this about family. Um, you just mentioned marriage and family together. I would suggest that the fundamental reality of family life is adoption, not marriage. And that marriage is, in a sense, the culmination of, uh, of, 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 of love, I suppose, and teaching and so on. But until that fundamental reality of adoption is accepted, again, by the church, um, and that you, you build like towards marriage, which is what most people do, let's face it. Yeah. Um, we're also going to get nowhere. Yeah. But a third is until the church starts talking in terms of structures, not just of generalizations, because that's the first part where it is in these generalizations, yeah. and it's not going to have much of an impact. Yeah. Um. Sorry, I'm saying some of this down. I won't remember it. Um, your first point about structures and uh, the laity, I think, is pretty obvious. I would have no problem with what you're saying. But no, you're absolutely right. And we do need to develop structures um, ad intra within the church, the institutional church, of course, I'm talking here, not the, not the people of God, um, that supports lay involvement that recognize the talents and the gifts of laity and so on um, and until that happens much of what we encounter within catholic social teaching is going to seem like a bit of a contradiction or hi hypocritical it's it's a it's a charge that's often leveled against the social teaching of the church whereby the magisterium uh, demands this of the world. We want societies to be more inclusive and more just and more transparent and more accountable. And we want human rights to be recognized and the, the equal dignity of all human beings. And yet within the uh, policies and structures of the church ad intra internally, those values aren't lived out to the same degree. Um, and I think that's a fair charge. And, um, you know, that needs to be, to be changed in, in, in some sort of way. But it's like every um, problem, if you like, the people who hold the power and can make those changes are the people that will probably lose out <laughs> most. And I would like to uh, once again say thank you to Suzanne for a wonderful presentation. And thank you all for coming.